Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I'm going to just be ridiculous with my hope. I don't care if it doesn't make any sense to hope. I'm going to hope. And I'm going to believe. And I'm going to trust. And I'm going to step out on the promises of God. See, you have no idea what you're capable of. And some of you will never find out if you don't listen to me this afternoon and say, I'm going to step out and find out. If you stare at your circumstances too long, you are in trouble. <laughs> If you look at yourself too long, you are in trouble. If you look at your own weaknesses too much, you are in trouble. Looking away from all that will distract unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. I didn't know what I was going to do last night, but... God knew, and I stepped out on it, and God showed up. And that's the way I've lived my life for the last 35 years. And you can do the same thing. Well, I wonder what it feels like to be Joyce Meyer. <laughs> Doesn't feel any different than it does to be Susie Jones or John Brown or anybody else. We're just people, just like you. And God uses us. And he'll do the same thing for you. All human reason for hope being gone. He hoped on in faith. Abraham didn't ignore his circumstances. He saw them. He knew how old he was. He knew how old Sarah was. He knew that what God was saying was impossible. But perhaps he remembered some of the amazing things that God had done in the past. And perhaps Abraham, just like us, decided that he was just going to be a prisoner of hope. Na, 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 na. I'm going to just be ridiculous with my hope. I don't care if it doesn't make any sense to hope. I'm going to hope. And I'm going to believe, and I'm going to trust, and I'm going to step out on the promises of God. See, you have no idea what you're capable of, and some of you will never find out if you don't listen to me this afternoon and say, I'm going to step out and find out. Well, what if I make a mistake? Well, it won't be the end of the world. What if I miss God? He'll find you. It's vital to understand your soul and how it functions. Let me say again that so many people live in the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions. I could teach on this for the next hundred years and people would still keep needing it. Well, I think, well, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think, I want, I want, I feel. I think I want, I feel, I want, I think, I feel, I feel, I think I want, I want, I think, I feel, I feel, I think I want. You just listen to people all the time. They tell you what they think. Well, I think. Well, let me, let me tell you what I think. Well, I think. I think. <laughs> well, I want. I want. Well, God, I want. Well, God, I want. God, I feel. God, I feel. I feel. <laughs> And what he wants to hear us say is, God, your will be done. Now, I don't want to be rude or, you know, sound harsh. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But you know what? It just really doesn't matter what we think. I mean, it just really flat out doesn't matter. It's what the Word of God says that matters, not what we think. And we have to learn to not think about some things. We think about things too much. Stop asking yourself how you feel and what you think and what you want and learn to live a little bit deeper, go a little bit deeper and say, God, you know, I don't think it really matters what I feel or what I think or even what I want. Not that God doesn't care about those things in your life, but what would have happened when Jesus was in Gethsemane and getting ready to go to the cross if he would have stood there and told God what he thought, what he wanted, and what he felt? Come on, think this over me. How much do you live by what you think? And 
And if that ain't bad enough, you call your friends and ask them what they think. <laughs> and that's really off the wall. <laughs> and honestly and truly, how much do you live by how you feel? It's not that we can't do some things we feel, but if what we feel is coming between us and God, then God needs to come first and the feelings need to go by the wayside. First, P first Thessalonians 5.8 says that we are to put on the helmet of hope. What do you think? <laughs> Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5.8. I don't mess my hair up for many people. You better appreciate this. <laughs> Amazing. But we belong to the day, therefore let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Well, some of you got your wrong hat on. You got on your hopeless helmet on. <laughs> you got to change hats today. Get on your helmet of hope. You got to think thoughts full of hope. If God can do it for anybody, God can do it for you. I don't care how long it takes, I'm not going to quit and I'm not going to give up. Abraham waited long, and he endured patiently, and I can wait too, and I can enjoy my life while I wait. And even though I'm in relationship with some people that I think sometimes are going to drive me mad, I can enjoy my life right in the midst of them because nobody else is in control of my joy but me. And I'm going to step out. And God's going to use me, and I am going to be amazed. <laughs> Romans 8, 5 through 7. For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. If you think about a chocolate cake long enough, you're going to go get one. <laughs> Where the mind goes, the man follows. You think about what somebody did to you that hurt you. And when you see them, it's highly unlikely that you're going to be able to treat them in love. Be careful what you think about. I said be careful what you think about. Be careful when you wake up in the morning what you think about. Be careful what you think about in the shower. Be careful what you think about while you're driving to work. This is your private life. This is the part of you that only you and God knows about. And this is where you've got to live a holy life. This is where you've got to do what's right when nobody's looking but God. Do you hear me? I don't care how much you underline your Bible, you can turn it into a coloring book. If you don't keep your mind right, it's not going to work for you. When you feel like your mind is going crazy, turn to Jesus. Let's put that scripture back up again. For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit, set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the Spirit. You've got to think about God a lot. That's why I said last night how important it is to think about the things that God has done for you. Not just everything you don't have, but everything you do have. God is so good to us. See what He is doing, not what He's not doing. Let's continue on with this scripture, please. Now the mind of the flesh, and I love this, is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. You know how many things we reason ourselves right out of that are the will of God? 
God's not asking us not to use any sense and reason, but he wants us to do it in the Holy Spirit, not not apart from the Holy Spirit. As soon as you start living out of your head and God is not involved, I mean, we are in trouble when we do that because I can tell you that a lot of things that God does do not make sense. And can I tell you something? If you're going to go full on with God, you might as well figure that you are going to get judged and criticized by some people because that's just what's going to happen. And you know, if I let God have his way, then I may get shut out of some circles, but praise the Lord. I'm in the circle I need to be in, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost circle. I would venture to say that a lot of things that God may want you to do may not make any sense to your mind, but if you just go a little deeper, Get out of your head. Get out of your head. Stop living off the top of your head. Stop asking yourself excessively what you think and find out what God thinks. Get the mind of God on things, not your own mind. Stop living by what you feel all the time. Well, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. I don't feel, I feel, I feel. Let's look at Romans 8, 12, and 13. I really love this scripture. Romans 8, 12 and 13. So then, brethren, we are debtors, but not to the flesh. We are not obligated to our carnal nature to live a life ruled by the standards set up by the dictates of the flesh. Do you understand that? You don't owe your flesh anything. It is not your job to keep it happy. <laughs> Come on. And the next time your feelings try to rule you, why don't you just say, I don't owe you anything. I don't have to keep you happy. Go right ahead and have your little fit. I'm not feeding you today. And you know what happens when you don't feed your emotions? They get weaker and weaker, and pretty soon they can't control you. You know how we feed them? Giving in to them, giving in to them, giving in to them, giving in to them. But you see, we don't like discomfort. So when your flesh doesn't get its way, it's uncomfortable for a little while, has its little fit. Come on, you all know how this works. How many of you have got a small child and you watch them throw a fit every time they don't get their way? Well, the flesh is the same way. <laughs> Do you have any idea how many days that I spent doing that? I'd go as far back in the house as I could get into the very back, smallest bathroom in the house, sit down the floor in front of the commode of all places. You know, if you're going to feel sorry for yourself, you might as well just be in the most pitiful position you can be in, in the most pitiful place in the house. And just, if you're going to be pitiful, just be really pitiful. <laughs> just think all these hopeless thoughts, nothing good ever happens to me. I just work all week. Dave gets out with people, and I'm stuck here with these kids all the time. And then he comes home and watches football, and then he goes off and plays golf on the weekend, and I just clean and clean and cook and clean and pay the bills and count the money and cook and clean and cook and clean. i tell you what, I was one person that needed to get out of my tent. You know how the flesh is. How many of you would just be willing today to give up pity parties? Could I get you to go on a pity fast for the next year? Come on, will you fast pity for the next year? Anybody in for it? Now you don't want to say yes too quick because as soon as you do, you're going to get attacked with it. I had to give up pity because God said you can be pitiful or powerful, but you're not going to be both. Take your pick. Amen. We're about to get there, I think. See, we had all of these wonderful principles this weekend, and I'm just trying really hard to show you now how to go home and put these to work in your practical, everyday life.
because this is where we've got to be godly in our everyday life, in the grocery store, in the marketplace, out in traffic, at work, at school, in the neighborhood. Everybody behaves in church. Oh, praise the Lord, sister. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now listen, get real. Life can be challenging. It can be difficult. Things happen we're not expecting. It can be challenging to be godly in such an ungodly world. Sometimes it's lonely to be the only person who's really trying to believe in God. It can be challenging to be patient, loving, kind, humble, gentle, meek, and merciful, especially when it's with people who don't treat you right. Whoa. It can be challenging to not be overweight in a society obsessed with food. It can, <laughs> it can be challenging to avoid being in debt in a society that's obsessed with things. It can be challenging to put up with obnoxious people and to keep forgiving them over and over and over and over. But here comes the good news. We are anointed for hard. You can do it. You can go home and be stable. You can go home and be just as happy as you were here. Uh, you don't believe me. I said you can. Did you see that one? You know, I'm going to enjoy my day tomorrow just as much as I've enjoyed this. Now, it's going to be maybe in a different way, but I'm still going to enjoy that day just as much as I've enjoyed this day. When are you going to get around to enjoying all of your life and not these little special high points that you only get once in a while? Come on. God's got an amazing plan for your life. I mean, just really so almost unbelievably amazing. God loves you. He loves you unconditionally. You need to love you. You need to reach out to the people around you and give them hope. We are the light in a dark world. And yes, there will be hard times and there will be attacks. But you know what? When you've had just about all you can take, <laughs> Okay, God, I have got to get out of here and get refreshed. You get out of your tent. Ah, praise the Lord. You keep on your helmet of hope. No matter what. I don't look good in hats, but that's it. Dave said you should lean it back so they can see your bangs. I said, no, I want it to look bad. <laughs> you hold on to your anchor. And when the devil comes against you, which he certainly will always try to, what? I know what to do. I know where to go. Ha, 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 ha. Nah, 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 nah. It's time for us to give the devil a nervous breakdown. Hang on to your anchor of hope. Wear your helmet of salvation. Stay in your prison of hope, and you will be a winner in life. Amen? I love you guys. I really pray that today's message about hope will challenge you to think about all the things that God has done for you 
and that it will help you not to dwell on what you don't have, but instead on your blessings. You know, a remarkable example of how to live focused on God's blessings is a young man whose story has inspired us here at Joyce Meyer Ministries, and I believe it's going to inspire you. His name is Nick Boyacek, born without arms and legs due to a rare disorder. Nick combined his hope with faith in God to live what he calls a life without limitations. Today, Nick is an evangelist, a motivational speaker, a husband, a father. Listen to what Nick has to say about finding hope in difficulties and hardships. You know, I think a lot of people are waiting on God to change the circumstance, to really be truly content in the Lord Jesus. But if you're not truly content in what Jesus has already done for you, you do not know what He's really done for you. Um, and that has set me free. And that has given me a platform to believe in miracles, but at the same time, not have to wait for miracles to happen before my joy in Jesus is true and full. Growing up in church, you know, every Sunday singing that song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know, to believe that God loves us requires a lot of faith because I had a lot of questions. If God loved me, then why did He let me be born this way? If God can do all miracles and anything that I ask, He can do it, then why doesn't He give me arms and legs when I ask Him to relieve me of my pain? I wanted to know the answer. I actually felt that God, for some reason, wasn't listening. For some reason, didn't answer my prayer. Um, and I was starting to think that He wasn't real. What was so, um, I guess, really difficult to get through were the years between ages 8 and 12. I was actually the first uh, special needs child to be integrated into a mainstream school. Um, being the only one with no arms and no legs, of course, and in a wheelchair, I had a lot of unwanted attention, um, feeling depressed, feeling alone. And at age 10, I actually tried to commit suicide by drowning myself in six inches of water in my family bathtub. After a whole day of being bullied and teased, I just didn't want to live anymore. By the grace of God, on the third time I rolled over in my family bathtub, I saw my mum and my dad crying at my grave. I saw that pain that I would leave behind, and I decided to stay. But I went through depression because no one could heal my heart. No money, no amount of friends, no amount of education or things that I quote unquote needed to get through my daily life. It just couldn't heal my heart. Finally, at age 15, God answered my prayer. And it was when I read John chapter 9. A man was born blind, born with a disability that no one could actually explain. And that sort of sounded familiar to me. People asked Jesus, why was this man born blind? And Jesus said it was done so that the works of God would be revealed through him. And faith came over me. Hearing of the word produces faith. It is a gift. It is not a focus that you can muster up inside. It is a gift given from God when you hear the promises through His Word. And that changed my life. He healed my heart and now I can be an instrument in His hand to let people know as a miracle, seeing His strength perfected in my weakness that would have otherwise been not as powerful it's more powerful seeing a man without arms and legs smiling than someone who got their miracle. What about for the people who didn't get their miracle? And for anyone who's watching right now who thinks that God doesn't have a purpose and what can God ever do with me? Well, look what God did with me. If God can use a man without arms and legs to be his hands and feet, there is not one person watching this program where God can't use their broken pieces too. Now I want to quote Romans 8, 28, where it says, All things come together for the good for those who love Him. You know, I thought that the greatest burden in my life was my circumstance. It is not. The greatest burden in your life is not your circumstance. The greatest burden in your life is you not being able to see your life 
clearly through God's eyes, knowing that he knows that he's going to be with you and he's going to pull you through, that all things come together for the good. Even the worst part of your life up to this point, God is so big, so mighty, so gracious that he can turn it into some good. If I was born without arms and legs and God did not give me arms and legs miraculously for one soul, bring it on. Well, you know, I think today's program on hope is very important for all of us to hear. Maybe you're struggling with a broken relationship, an illness, you've lost your job. It could be a thousand different things. There's a lot of different ways that people have difficulties in their life. But whatever the situation, no matter what the situation is, we all need to be reminded that we always have hope in Christ. And we need to keep that hope activated. It needs to be an alive thing. And even to vocalize, I do have hope. My hope is in God. Because trust me, the enemy wants you to be hopeless. He wants you to think nothing is ever going to change. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and, you know, taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. Today, we happen to be in Thailand and this little boy's name is Somded, and he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident, and when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now. And so thank you for helping us provide homes for Somded and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. <laughs> 